Welcome everyone here this evening. We are having a study on the book of Job. And I must tell you, it has really become and is quite a challenge. Quite a challenge. Uh, since I am hearing impaired, I'd like to ask you if you can move to the middle and maybe come down front. That way I can hear you when you ask a question, if you have a question. And then, so those of you who can move or feel like comfortable doing so, please do that. You may remember that last week, near the end of the class, let me have one of them, Dayton read something for us that was... Uh, very thought-provoking. Well, what it dealt with and what we're beginning to learn in the book of Job is what we say may not necessarily be what we mean, or what we mean to say may not be what the person hears. In other words, what I'm saying is it's not the message that we send that is important to people who are in dire straits, people who are struggling, people who are hurting. What's important is the message that's received. Now, these are being passed out, and this was somewhat comical. But let's just look at them real quick before we get into the dialogue between Job and his third person. But these are statements that patients would rather not hear, whether you're in the hospital or not. Now, perhaps these may be thought-provoking to you to say, yeah, I have said something similar to that, and maybe it may not have been received well. But look at the first one here. It says, wow, look at the flowers in here. Looks like you're getting ready for a funeral. <laughs> These are real live statements that people have made, and where this came from was a church bulletin that uh, Dayton left me have to make the copy of these. The second one, I've just got a second to say hi. Who's your doctor? Have you checked him out? Third one, do you know massive doses of vitamins could have prevented that? <laughs> Hospital food's always terrible. Oh, I hope you appreciate all the trouble I went to find this place. <laughs> it sure is hot in here, I'll tell the nurse to adjust the thermostat. <laughs> Are you beginning to get the idea here? When you're down and out, when a person is in the hospital, Number one, initially, they probably really don't want visitors, but when they're recuperating and they're getting ready to go home, then maybe visitors would be nice. The next one, at least you got a break from the kids. It may be true, but that may not necessarily be words of love. I can't believe I had to pay to park just to see you. All the nurses are just sitting around out there. I've never seen you with your hair not combed and with makeup. <laughs> well, I think you get the drift. Read them. And may we always and forever keep in mind what we say. Here we are studying the book of Job. Now we have, I put a phrase up here, there's a man of unmerited suffering often used today as a typical example of anyone who is a suffering servant. Well, we've established a lot of things so far. This is week five. The second person that, did, that Job had a conversation with was a guy by the name of Bildad, who was a Shuite from Shua. And a Shuite was a member of an Arabic nomadic tribe that wandered near the land of Uz on the east bank of the Euphrates River. Well, if any of you have ever taken Origins of Western Civilization 101 in school, there's a thing called the Fertile Crescent. Well, this is on the eastern side of the Fertile Crescent, right where the Tigris and the Euphrates go together. Here we see it. We see a map and we see where the land of Uz is. There's where the Euphrates is and the arrow is pointing to the east side of the Euphrates River. Well, this is where Bildad was from. 
And one of the things about Bildad, oh, he was such a loving friend. He attributed Job's misery to his wickedness. Now, before we go on to dialogue number three, and there's a total of seven of them in Job, just for a moment, let's see if we can picture what Job was like. I see some, some new faces, and that's wonderful. Job was covered with boils from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. Can you imagine? Just the discomfort having a, a boil was unbelievable. Has anyone here ever had a boil? I had a boil and I had to have it lanced. And that wasn't very comfortable either. But Job had boils from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. Because of the boils, he was probably clothed very scathingly, or well, that's not the right word, didn't, probably didn't have much clothes on. You know it's hot. It's very uncomfortable, sitting in the dirt and the dust. And then he had a bunch of friends that came from afar. Well, how do you define friend? Well, these were Job's friends, but we're beginning to see Maybe that word friend was not the right word to describe who they were. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Dialogue 3, which is Zophar's dialogue with Job. And if you want to turn with me, if you want, we may be reading some. It's in Job chapter 11, verses 1 through 20. Well, what I do, what, for those of you who are new, what I've done is I've tried to make it easy for us. First we go through and see what the scriptures say, and then we kind of make it easy. Because I have come to realize as I'm looking and studying this, Job is not an easy book. It's rather challenging. Well, here we find that in Job chapter 11, verse 2, the friend, Zophar, said, How long will you speak these things to God? referring to the dialogue with Ephes and Bildad. Now, you have to understand, there was three of them there. All three of them were hearing the same thing. So in order, perhaps, to appreciate this a little more, you've got to go back and read the other dialogues. But he's saying, hey, guy, how long are you going to do this? Do you know how you're talking? Well, he goes on and he says, your words are loose. You should be ashamed of your mocking, 11 verses 2 and 3. Well, you know, Job was down and out. He felt like there was no hope. Can you, has anyone here ever been in such pain that you could not think of anything else but the condition you were in? And then to have some friends come by and just verbally tear you up call you a liar. You don't know what you're talking about. Job, listen to yourself. You should be ashamed. Your tongue is loose. Well, let's see what else he says. You say that your doctrine is pure. Mm-hmm. What's God say? Wow. Have we ever got into a dialogue with someone of another persuasion? that may not have been ill, but we may say, do you? What makes you think your doctrine's pure? There's nothing new under the sun, is there? Here we find Zophar, Job's friend, is challenging him on his belief. Well, do you remember what we read about Job but back in Job chapter 1? Chapter 1, verse 1, it says that Job and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Here was a righteous man in the eyes of God. And look what his friends are saying to him. Is your doctrine pure? What's God say? Well, let's look a little further. Chapter 11, verse 6, it says, 
boy, oh boy, oh boy, look at this. You deserve a whole lot more than you already got. You deserve far more from God. Your iniquities are great. Well, do we have someone here who is standing in judgment of him? Perhaps. And he says, your suffering needs to be greater than it already is. Because your iniquities are great. Wow. Got that starred in, in red. Isn't that a slap? Wow. This is a friend? Oh, yeah. Well, then we find in verse 7, can you search the things of God and find or to know what God knows? Boy, oh boy, is he challenging Job. Enough to say, you really don't know what you're doing. You don't have any idea of the things that you're saying. 11, verse, chapter 11, verse 11. They said, God knows deceitful and wicked men. You know, that statement unto itself implies what about Job in the eyes of Zephar? He's a real popular guy, right? <laughs> Everybody loves him. No. That statement unto itself says that in the eyes of Zophar, Job was deceitful and a wicked man. Well, that's counter to what we read in Job 1, 1 and 2. Yet here we have a friend. Hmm. John, that on the surface, many of these statements his friends are making are true about God, about what God knows and his knowledge compared to our knowledge. Uh, so on that level, you know, there's, there's much of this can be taken as truth. But as you say, it's, it's how they apply it to Job. Is, becomes excellent. False. An excellent point. Because a lot of, like you say, a lot of these things are true in the church. Who can you search the heart of God? Do you know what God is saying? Well, none of us can do that. But when someone is down and out, and you're saying that you're deceitful, and that you're wicked, how do you know what God's thinking about you? But the sword cuts both ways. What they say about Job is also true of themselves. I mean, they're <laughs> bad, bad philosophy. Outstanding comment. Have we ever walked that mile with people? I can only speak for myself, and I think I, I have. No, oh, it's not something to be proud of. We have to put ourselves in the person's place to whom we are speaking. And sometimes that's nearly impossible. But here we have it. God knows deceitful and wicked men. Then he goes on to say, you need to get right. You need to turn to God. Have we ever known of someone that they were really down and out? They were living a life of immorality, had challenges that they were facing that we probably didn't understand, and we just look at it. You need to get right with God. You need to turn to God. Hmm. Like you say, it's a true statement. <laughs> but whatever happened to, do you know, God loves you right where you are in the situation that you find yourself. I don't understand it. And then tell your story. Tell your story. Because you will always know, book, chapter, and verse of your story. Try to impart an understanding. Try to impart empathy to the person you're speaking with. God loves you. I'm so sorry you're going through what you're going through. I can't imagine the pain. Well, he goes on also to say in chapter 11, verse 14, put iniquity, iniquity and wickedness far from you. Again, he is implying very heavily that Job is wicked, and that he has all kinds of sin in his life. 
Well, you know, if we strip off all the paint and get right down to the bare metal, and don't necessarily be politically correct, don't we all have a whole lot of iniquities in our life? You know, in John chapter 8, Jesus said, He who without sin cast the first stone. Perhaps those people who are struggling to levels that we have no idea of, perhaps words, God loves you. I'm here for you. What can I do? Or if you don't want to ask the question, be very perceptive and look and see if there are any needs that you can meet. You know, one time had a had an older man come to me and he said, you know, when so-and-so lost his loved one, I went to the house and searched for a closet. And in the closet I found a pair of shoes. And I sat down and I shined the shoes. And then I left and told him, I love you. If there's anything else I can do, let me know. Who ever would have thought shining a pair of shoes for a man who has lost his wife, how much that must have meant? Have you ever heard the saying, it's the little things that count? Shine someone's shoes. Tell them God loves them. Be there for them. And when I was co-minister with, an old boy, with another man who came out of the Jewish faith, oh boy, what a wonderful man he was. His name was Ken Wasserstrom, good old Jewish boy. His favorite expression was, walk your talk. You know, in Christ, when people look at you and they look at me, they really need to be able to see Jesus. And I'll tell you what, if it takes shining a pair of shoes, count me in. Yeah, Zafar said, put your iniquities and your, wit wit and your wickedness far from you. He doesn't stop there. He says, if you do this, look what's going to happen Misery will be like water that has passed away. Wow. In other words, your misery is just going to go away, Job. What do you mean? Go away. Put your iniquities and weakness. You need to get right with God. Turn to God. And if you do this, look what's going to happen to you. Well, that may be true. It may take some time. But that's when a person is down and out. That's not something they really need. Wouldn't it be better to say, God loves you? I do too. What can I do for you? Well, let's see if we can't make this dialogue a little bit simple. He kind of says, how can you expect to be justified talking like that? listening to the dialogue that he had with his two other friends. And he goes on and he says, Why, well, you're full of boasting. Didn't stop there. He says, I'm just, you say. I'm pure, you blab. Those are my words. Ha! Huh. If God would talk, he'd tell you, God knows. He sees secret sins. What in the world does that have to do with making Job feel better? And then he says, you deserve far more than you got, buddy. Well, I know, wouldn't that be apropos? Perhaps it is to me. Would it be for you? You answer that question. But he's telling him, you deserve far more than you got. <laughs> But he doesn't stop there. He says, but there's still hope, Job. There's still hope. Really? After all these things you've told me? Yeah, there's still hope. Get your heart right with God, and, and he'll still accept you. 
But watch out. There's no escape for the wicked. Again, Job, you're a wicked dude. There's only, there's only hope, their only hope is death, implying to those who are wicked. Well, again, a statement I made last week, can't you just imagine <laughs> with friends like this, I sure would hate to have enemies. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it is so important for us to be able to, to switch places, put ourselves in the other person's position. You had a comment? Interesting to me that you know, all three of these guys obviously verbally unloaded on Joe. Um, like I said, a friend like that will their attention, but they did spend a week sitting with him before they said anything. Uh, and it's interesting that Chapter 2 mentioned that they made an appointment together to go see him together to comfort him. It's almost like when they, you know, they clear their schedule or whatever, an appointment, make an appointment with Joe to do that. They had some kind of arrangement, you know, where they cleared their schedule and took the time. Um, and they spent seven days not saying anything. I think there's a parallel lesson there for us. Sometimes we want people to grieve, but at some point we get impatient. All right, it's time to, time to get over this, time to suck it up, time to move on. And people have to do it in their own way, I think. Initially, they have good intentions. They spent that time. It's been a week. Um, but it's like, okay, the week's over, and then they unload it on it. Like, okay, time's up. You, you've had you know, your pity party. Now it's time to move on. And I think sometimes we do the same thing. We, we try to have good intentions, tell people, you know, grieving time's over, time to move on, you know, move on in your life, and they have to do it in their own way when they're ready. Oh. Kind of lesson there, right? Words of wisdom. I'm glad you pointed that out, that they were there with him for seven days before they even spoke to him. They were observing him. Sometimes just being in the presence of someone is consoling. But when we get tired of consoling, <laughs> it's not the time to <laughs> lock and load <laughs> and to dump. And have we done that? Have you done that? I have to tell you that perhaps there are times that I have done that. And oh, I'm not, I'm not proud of that at all. But you know, when we share the situation that we live, the mile that we've walked, the bumps that we've hit, the pits in the ground that we've stumbled over, when we begin to share them with one another, we begin to develop an awareness of what it means to show the love of Christ. Let's see what Job had to say. Job responded. Only well, took two chapters for him to respond. Look what he said here. In Job chapter 12, verse 2, he says, You are the people of all wisdom. Well, they're telling him all kinds of things, aren't they? Not only telling him things, as has been pointed out, they were true, but they're not necessarily the things that he wanted to hear. Look what else he says. I understand things as well, and I am not inferior to you. Oh, that so strongly implies that they were giving the impression that they were superior to Job. You know, isn't it wonderful to know that our Lord is not a respecter of persons? He doesn't see a big guy, a little guy, a big woman, a little woman. He doesn't see man or woman. We are all one in Christ. Perhaps as we walk life, we can allow people to see that. Yeah. Their culture is completely different than our culture and what we know and realize. And it's uh, interesting ironic that they were getting, or he was getting on them for talking down to him. And it's hard to believe because, of course, Americans are very arrogant and haughty in the whole, it seems like. And when we talk about even Oklahoma, Okies, compared to other states, let alone other countries. And it's hard to picture how much they were talking down to him. 
parallel, or I guess a, a level or an extender. Good insight. Good insight. Perhaps, well, what can we take from this? Perhaps what we can take from this, there, there's never a time that we can justify or we can talk down to someone. Especially when they're down and out. And through the book, who is the one that's righteous? There's only one righteous one listed in there. That's so true. So true. We all fall short, don't we? Every one of us we fall short. Look at here. You, my friends, isn't that wonderful? He says, you, my friends, mock me. You ridicule me. Verses 4 through 6 of chapter 12. Why? Well, Job kind of got bold, didn't he? He said, I think I've just about had it. I've heard it now from three of you. Heard from each one of you once already. How comes you're mocking me? How comes you're ridiculing me? Why? Then he gives a book with great wisdom. He said, ask the beasts, the birds, the earth, the fish of the sea. They know God made everything again and gave it all life. Wow. He's kind of telling them, well, let's keep the priority set here. We know who is in charge. We know who the creator is. And he goes on to say, wisdom is with aged men. They have wisdom and strength. Counsel of understanding, chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. It almost makes you want to ask the question, who was the elder of the, th of the four? <laughs> he goes on then, he says, my eyes have seen all of this. What you know, I know as well. You're not telling me anything I haven't seen, anything I haven't heard. This is not new to me. And he says, even if God set out to kill me, look at this. Even if God set out to kill me, chapter 13, verses 15 through 18, I will trust him. I know I will be what? Vindicated. You know, we are all, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, we have been justified by our faith in Christ Jesus. Well, justify or justification is a legal term, which means we're treated as though we are sinless, even though we're not. We're treated as though we are sinless because we are in Christ. When God looks down from heaven, he doesn't see John. He doesn't see Dayton. If we are in Christ, he sees Christ. So we are treated as though we are sinless, even though we are not. So in that way, in that likeness, Job knew that one day he would even be vindicated. Isn't it wonderful what Christ has done for us? Wow. And there are two things he asked of God. Chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, he says, Don't withdraw your hand from me, and may I never fear you because of the dread that you could cause. Wow. You know, when I read that scripture, I thought of someone real special to me in the Bible. I, I have used the example many, many times. Has anyone here ever heard of a guy by the name of Jabez? We find in 2 Chronicles, I can't remember the book and verse, or chapter and verse, but in 2 Chronicles, Jabez uttered a prayer. And he said, this is kind of the way it went in, in context. He says, bless me indeed, praying to God. Bless me indeed and broaden my borders. Never leave my side and may I never cause pain to anyone. And the next words of that prayer were, God heard his prayer. 
I thought about that when I was reading this where Job said, don't withdraw your hand from me. It's like, God, never leave my side. Hold me in the hollow of your hand and be with me through thick and thin, through good and bad. And when I'm in good times, help me to help those who are in times less fortunate. Well, let's see if we can make it simple about what he said. He said, you guys are so smart. You sure know it all. Ever run into anybody like that? <laughs> oh, that, may, that gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling, doesn't it? <laughs> He says, well, I know just as much as you do. And I know God has all wisdom and power, just like you've, we've seen. And I know he sets people up and he knocks them down, and sure, God is working in our lives. Do we realize that? God's working in our lives 24-7, 365. But because of perhaps the way we have been taught, the way of our upbringing, we've been taught, well, if you, you, you got to do it all by yourself. Reach down, grab yourself, pull it up by your bootstraps, and get on. We'll put one step in front of the other. Just keep on keeping on. Oh, God's alive and well in our lives 24-7. He was alive and well in Job's life 24-7. He says, oh, I wish I could talk to God about this. You stick up for God and say, I must be wrong. Well, we're wrong. You're unfair on his side, talking to those who spoke with him. And he goes on to say, I know I'm right. I'd say it to God face to his God's face as well as to yours. I am right. Job knew who he was. He knew he wasn't all the things that his great friends were telling him he was. He knew that. And he concluded by saying, I haven't done wrong. Well, if we go back to the very beginning, you remember God told Satan, you can do whatever you want to Job, but just don't take his life. Whew. Wow. I think that says that God knows a lot more about John than John does. God knows a lot more, perhaps, about you than, than you do. Oh, our faith is so, so important. And when the going gets tough, our faith needs to be growing, and that's easy to say. You know, when you're there with someone who is suffering excruciating pain, and you look around and you say, where are our friends? <laughs> Where's our help? It's a feeling of helplessness. That's a very uncomfortable feeling. It's times like that we need to lean upon our faith. Trust in the Holy Spirit who lives within us. You remember Jesus said, I must go. It's to your advantage that I go. So that he, the Holy Spirit, can come. He lives in us. And who is he? He is our helper and he's our comforter. He intercedes for us. He bears witness with us that we are who we say we are to our Heavenly Father. You know, we can fool one another or people of the world, but we can't fool God. Don't we want to have the Holy Spirit interceding for us when a loved one is there in pain? You don't know what to do. That's a terrible place to be. I walked a little bit of that mile this week. He also said, oh God, it's not fair. Men are so frail and so weak. Stop it. Don't do this to me. You're wearing away all my hope. You know, hope is just four letter words. It's a four letter word. May we never ever give up our hope. It is so strong. 
You know, during the Korean War, there was a point in time where the American GIs would sit in a corner and would take a blanket and throw it over their heads. I don't know if you've ever read about this or not. And they were dead within 12 hours. An analysis of what was taking place was those who were in that place at that time struggling the way they were struggling, they gave up hope. They gave up living. Oh, God loves you so much. He loves you and me so much. He loves everyone so much. You know, the scripture that we have all committed to memory so many times, John 3, 16, for God, King James Version, <laughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that what? Whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. And what's one of the first things we ask when a person wants to obey the gospel? Do you believe <laughs> that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. What prevents me from being baptized, thou mayest? <laughs> oh, wow, isn't that amazing? May we never give up hope. And I have no idea what trials that will, be, will beset me in my years uh, that are ahead of me. But we need to pray for one another that our hope is never shaken. That our love for the Lord be just like it was for Job's. May it not be shaken. This is that First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. This is the prayer I was telling you about. It's the prayer of Jabez. First Chronicles 4, 10. And Jabez called on the Lord of Israel, saying, Oh, that you, may, that you would bless me indeed, enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, and that I may not cause any pain. And look at the next words. So God granted him what he requested. Now the part of the prayer I forgot, would you keep me from evil? Oh, goodness, yes, please, Lord, keep us from evil. Maybe may we reach out. May we extend love to a level perhaps we never have before. Job would have appreciated that. And just as we've heard tonight, the statements that these wise men said were absolutely true. But remember, it's not the message that we send that's important. It's the message that's received. And you might say, what do you mean by that, John? Well, here's a real life example. Not only the message, because a lot of the messages that we send, a lot of it has to do with body language, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. If I look at you and say, I love you, let me know if I can help you. How sincere do you think that was? You really don't know, but you can get messages from the body language. But if I look at Bonnie and I say, Bonnie, I love you. Was there a different message? I would like to think there was. Oh, there's so many ways in which we can show people the love of which Jesus loved us so that we can learn and be able to extend love to others as well. Now, who thought you would ever get this out of the book of Job? <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> we now go to dialogue number two next week of the first person that encountered, the Job encounter. Questions or comments, real good comments for those of you who had, have made comment, outstanding comments. Any questions? Nathan.
12th chapter and the 13th uh, speaks, uh, I think, from about verse 10 or 11 to 24, every verse starts with me, what God has done, praising him. And, and he was paying high tribute. And these characters come back and they talk to him, and he goes down and then he, he wants to have an audience with God. And he seems to slip. Uh, I think of an old gentleman that I heard about that was fishing out by the river. He's casting out, and a man walked up behind him and said, Sir, you might ought to watch. He baits about to crawl out of the bucket. And uh, the old gentleman didn't even look around. He said, Down yeah, on. And he said, but they're just about to get out. And, and the old gentleman there did turn around. But each time that one would get just about the top to get out, the other would crawl on that one's back and pull it down, and, and it all started over again. That's the book of Job in many respects. They keep tearing down one another, and they'll move back to God and then they back off after they get hit with the discouraging comments of the ones that were supposed to be encouraging. And uh, that's kind of the way the joke in the book unfolds. He'll go back and forth with his praise of God and then he wants God to listen to him. And, and like I know my Redeemer lives, that's in there. But uh, at another time, he's full of fear and doubt and ready to die, wants to die. And uh, if we could just realize that we're to edify one another, not pull one another down. <coughs> that oh. would help us a lot. Interesting you bring that song up, David. I know that my Redeemer lives, the next word, but. Oh, may you be encouraged tonight. Go home and read through these chapters of Job and see if you can't pick out some of the things that Dayton has just so marvelously brought to our attention. Because it's very true that all four of these guys know God. But they don't know how to encourage one another very well. All right. Thank you. See you next week. God bless.